Amen. Amen. Go ahead and y'all take a seat. Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to City Light. Hey, if you're new, please fill out a connect card that's on your seat or nearby. And then um, also in the lobby, you can sign up for the newsletter if you're not on it yet. Uh, from here on out, from this day forward, uh, the newsletter is going to be the primary source of information. We will send one out every week. All right, it's our commitment to you. And uh, you can hopefully never, ever be confused here at City Light, all right? So if you'll sign up for that, it'll also encourage you. There'll be some, uh, some teaching, a little bit of a word, an encouragement, uh, an article, uh, and then some information about what's going on at City Light. You can sign up in the lobby, super important. That way you'll never miss a beat as to what's going on here around City Light. We also have a team in Nicaragua right now. Uh, that is serving the Lord there that we're super excited about, um, doing some evangelism, uh, doing uh, some pastor training, working with local churches, uh, serving the poor, all the different things. And so we're really thankful that we're able to partner with some good people on the ground to be able to hopefully just blow wind on their work. That's always our goal globally is to not show up with anything about ourselves, uh, but to just to come encourage what they're doing, uh, help, help support the work on the ground so it can continue when they leave. So just be praying for them. They're there for another couple of days um, and they're really doing some awesome some stuff and we're excited about that. In a couple of weeks, we send a few people, or we send a team to Mexico as well uh, to go serve and bless um, even in one of the most dangerous cities in the world. And uh, so we're thankful for all the ways that we can serve around the globe. Just want to put that in front of you, uh, that your generosity, time, effort, resources, all of that uh, is helping people be able to serve the Lord in this way and serve our world. And also you're welcome to go in any of these. They're always available to you and there's several every year. All right. So today, Listen, I have really good news for you today. I am going to present to you the answer for all the problems in your life, all right? Yeah, yeah. Today, I am going to give you your problems. I'm going to explain all your problems. Why do you have all the problems that you have, all right? Don't look at the person next to you. It's not all their fault, okay? Why do you have all the problems that you have? And what is the solution to all the problems that you have? Today is going to be a massive problem-solving endeavor uh, that we're going to answer every question you could ever ask in about 30 minutes, okay? So it's going to be amazing, all right? Praise the Lord. He's going to work during this time. This is basically what the passage in Scripture does for us this morning is it presents to us uh, the problem with ourselves, with the world around us, and then it gives us the solution. So go ahead and open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2. All right, we're going to hear from the Lord this morning. Just a quick uh, explanation of what's happening. So the Apostle Paul is explaining the gospel to a group of people that were previously very spiritual but not religious. And this group of people whose basically mantra in life was to, if it feels good, then do it, All right? So it's the same as us. I just want you to understand that the world that he's presenting this information to is obviously in many ways different, but in the essential ways, very much the same. The way everyone thought was pretty generally the same as the way we think now. Just if it feels good, do it. That's pretty much what people around you believe. And uh, they, had, they were spiritual, but not religious. They um, had this temple of Artemis. They were very wanting this realm of the spirit. And they tried witchcraft and all these different things. If you read Acts 18, 19, you can see this. But I want to help you understand that how Paul's going to explain something to them is very much how he would explain it to us. Uh, and the way they thought and their desire to be spiritual but not religious and to pursue the cravings of the body and to go after those is pretty much the world we live in as well. And so this is what Paul's going to say to them. And this is how he would explain it to us. Ephesians chapter 2. The problem and solution. Here we go. Verse 1. And you are dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Problem. Verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
All right, this is what we're going to see this morning. We're going to stop here. And basically the first three verses help describe the problem. The last six or seven here describe the solution. And I want everyone to at least give me these next 30 minutes. So whether you're like way outside of Christ and you're, you're seeking these things and trying to learn and understand them, or whether you've walked away, you know, from the faith prior before, something to maybe learn, you say, I don't really want to live that way anymore. Or, you know, whether you're here today and you say, man, I do want to follow Christ. I encounter obviously a lot of difficulty along the way trying to figure out how to, how to do this. Uh, the Lord really has a, a word or something for each of you to understand. And so I want, please give me these next, next 30 minutes uh, for you to at least hear what God might have to say that might explain some things in your life that don't make sense to you right now uh, because the Lord wants to work in, in and through you. So here's the problem. The problem in verse, for chapter two, verse one, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. Here's the problem. Uh, the problem is that you're dead, all right? This is the problem. You're a walking zombie, okay? You're, you're dead. You are, you are the living dead that sin has killed me, you, and the entire world. This is the problem. And the Bible calls death, it uses death as a, as a phrase to describe not just physical death, but alienation from life. So your real problem is that you're dead, which means you are separated from life, which means and explains your never ending search to find life in every possible way you could think of, which is why it gets so depressing when it doesn't ever work. Okay, because you're dead and you're trying to find life somewhere. So the, the Bible teaches us here that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. Our sins have killed us. I mean, this is true from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3. The world's perfect. Adam and Eve enter into sin. Sin brings death, physical and spiritual, into the world. This creates all the havoc that we see around us. The Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. And so now the reality for all of us in the world is that our sin has, has killed us and that we are dead. And really what you want to think about is dead on the inside. I mean, the zombie idea is fairly appropriate to say uh, you might be physically alive, but you're really dead outside of Christ. And this is the problem that we have in the world around us. And sin has killed us and is killing us and we are dead. Now, here's what I want to stop real quick because I've already lost some of you, you know? You came to church there. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, here I am. I'm dead, whatever. And I want you to think about this for a second, though, uh, about the reality of your spiritual condition. So wherever you're at, especially if you're here, you say, I'm not quite following Christ yet. I want you to think about it in this terms. Uh, so you say, theologically, I don't quite understand or care or agree. Okay, that's fine. Experientially, though, you intuitively know this. You know that you're dead on the inside, which is why you try to do all these things to bring yourself to life. But the reason you know you're dead, this is how you know. You know you're dead because nothing works to give you life. This is how you know you're dead, because nothing works. Nothing works. Why is it that no joy fully satisfies? There is always something missing. Why is it that no amount of riches and fame or external benefits actually change the internal reality of my life? That's how you know you're dead. You can accumulate every possible thing the world has to give and be the same person on the inside. Why is that? Why is that you could add riches, fame, wealth, worldly pleasure, and still be just as depressed, lonely, and empty on the inside? Why is that? Give me an explanation. It's because you're dead. You're dead on the inside. This is the problem. This is the problem I have. This is the problem that you have. This is the problem that the world has, that we are dead. And listen, if you were, if you were limping, all right, if you were just hurt, a cast could fix it. If your cup was just a little empty in life, then a little more could complete it. You know, if your life was near completion, then one more piece of the puzzle could solve it. But it never does. It never does. And you know this to be the case. The way to fix your wounds doesn't really heal. You need more than a cast, and you know that. The more you add to your life, your cup is never full. No matter how much you pour in, there's still something lacking. The next piece you put in the puzzle is just a sign that your puzzle is still mostly empty and there's a million pieces that you do not have to put together the picture of your life. You are not almost there. You have not almost made it. You are not one step, one decision, one circumstance away from finally being complete. You are, a matter of fact, dead, and you know it. 
You know it. This is why nothing works for you. So this is the, Bi- the picture the Bible presents to us, but it's also the reality that you intuitively know on the inside. Whether you're following Christ or not, you know this to be true about you, that nothing really works and nothing really gets you what you're really looking for. And the reason for that is because you're dead. And that's where the Bible leaves us in this problem, okay? So sin has killed us. You're experiencing that death every day of your life. And this is the problem that you experience and it's the problem that you bring to the world because it says it's not just something happening to you. Verse one says, verse two, in which you once walked. So not only is the problem out there, the problem's in here. You have participated in this reality called sin, which is rebellion against God. And this has brought death in your life. And even though the problem is spiritual, you have sinned against God. You try to seek worldly solutions for your spiritual problem, which is once again, I cannot say this enough. Please listen. Why no amount of things you can get in the world will solve the problem that you have because it's spiritual in nature. How can you solve a spiritual problem with worldly results? You can't. You can't get the best girlfriend, the best trophy, win the thing, get the best job, even get a uh, more healthy body. None of those things actually solve the problem because it's spiritual. And you know this, so you're dead on the inside and all your worldly efforts don't actually solve the problem that you have, that you have participated in yourself, myself, because of our sin. So uh, what you experience intuitively in life, no matter what you believe, the Bible calls sin having killed the life in you. Those are the categories we're gonna get. So that's gonna help for a second, at least explain some things to you. So our, our sins have brought on these, these problems in our souls. So the problem is we're dead. Now, it's not just us at work, but I want to show you what the Bible presents to us as three main enemies of the soul. Three main reasons why you are dead. Three main reasons why you are in the position that you are in. Three main enemies that work against your soul. Uh, and this is important for us to understand because so many of you, especially as Christians trying to follow Jesus, uh, You're swinging at enemies you don't know. And you don't actually know the target that you're hitting. You just know you'd like to be happier than you are. You know that you'd like more freedom uh, in life than you have now. You know you don't want to be sinning in this way anymore. You know know all that. But you're just kind of swinging as opposed to actually fighting the enemy in front of you. Uh, And the reason for that is you just don't know what the enemy is like and what the things you need to understand about your life. And so what I want to do in in front of you today is, because this is what happens. You you swing, you swing, you swing, you swing. You get worn out because you're trying to be a Christian. You burn out and you say, this is not worth it anymore. And the reason for that is you never knew the enemy. You weren't fighting. You're just swinging. I'd get tired too. You know, that's not how this works. So I want to today, I want to help I'm going to help aim your shots, okay? Aim your punches, aim your fight at the actual enemies of your soul. Now, the real the reality for this as well is most of the things you call problems in life are not actual problems, and the things that you are missing, the real problems of your life are the things you're ignoring. That where I'm going to lay in front of you today. And you spend an awful lot of time dealing with problems, which are real problems, I'm not minimizing them, but they're not the actual thing that's at war against your well-being and your soul. All right. So the three enemies of the soul the Bible presents to us are these three things, the devil, the world, and the flesh. These are the three enemies of your soul. You see this from the beginning of the Bible to the end, but here in Ephesians chapter two, it just summarizes it nice and easy for us. The devil, the world, and the flesh. Right here, the verses say, the prince of the power of the air, the course of this world, and the passions of the flesh. These are the three things that war against your life. These are the three things that are preventing you from finding life and resurrection. These are the three things that are keeping you dead in your trespasses and sins. And even as a Christian, for many of us, these are the three things that are still still plaguing us now today. The devil, the world, and the flesh. Now I want to start once again with another caveat for some of you who may say, man, that's kind of hard to believe in the devil. You say, I came to church, and we're talking about the devil. Why did I come to Greek mythology class? Like, what are we doing here? Uh, The picture of your mind in the devil is the one that gets drawn up in cartoons. You know, it's a red guy with a a pitchfork, and he's got horns and a long tail, you know? 
And that's your idea of the devil. And so then you come into a gathering and somebody says, well, the devil's out there. And you say, oh, that's so ridiculous. You know, it's 2023. Everybody knows that's stupid. You know, you come in here and you have that attitude towards it, which I, I don't blame you for that. I understand why you could think that. But I want to present to you some reasons as to why you might want to consider the reality here uh, for you to consider the reality of the devil. One one, don't you think it would be the devil's main tactic, tactic to make you think it's silly that he exists? Wouldn't that be better? That would be the best thing. If I was him, I'd say, I'm just going to make everyone think I'm too ridiculous to believe in. That way, nobody even bothers with me or thinks about me anytime. That would be my main tactic. So what if you're already in the hands of the devil in that way to say, man, it's too silly for me to believe in something like that. I also want you to consider an even more difficult question for you to answer. Okay, uh, if the devil's too silly for you, then where does all the evil in the world come from? I mean, what do you, where, is just an accident? Where does all the evil in the world come from? And you know what makes this harder for you to answer? Is the irony that in the world around us, the teaching of the world around us is the assumption that humans are basically good, which is why the teaching is to follow every desire of your heart. If you're basically good, then you should trust your internal desires and you should live accordingly. And that will lead you into the good life. That's the teaching of the world. That's a summary. You're good. Do what feels good. Live according to who you think you are and be free and enjoy your life. That's basically what the world's teaching you around you. You know, this is, this is how we understand things around you. So if you believe that and humans are basically good, then what in the world explains the dramatically wicked things that we do? I just don't know if you've thought it through. Do you have a have you thought it through? To say like, well, okay, if, I'm, if humans are basically good and I should trust my internal desires, which the passage here is going to flip that on its head completely. If humans are basically good and I should trust my internal desires, then where in the world does the really, really wicked things of the world come from? Where does that come from? If you think humans are basically good and you think the devil's silly, then just give me an answer. Right? You don't, there's just not really one there. So now you have to really begin to consider these things. It's not as silly as you thought, is it? Where does the evil in the world come from? The dramatically wicked things that, that humans do. The things that you look at and you don't even understand. You say, how in the world could someone do that to someone? And not only is that true around us, but then within us. If humans are basically good, then why are some of your desires suppressed? Why are there things that you think internally that you know you ought not to live out? You hate this person, but you know you're not supposed to murder them. Why would you suppress that desire and fulfill another one? If you're good, then you're good. If you're bad, then you're bad. But you have to pick one or the other. Okay, so this is what I want you to understand. Why do we have rules to keep society in check? I mean, just think these things through. Why do we have rules to keep society in check? Why do we have bad desires that we know we shouldn't fulfill? Where do these things come from? And in light of that reality, I think we need to take the reality of the devil and a spiritual realm around us that's influencing us, we should take that way more seriously. I, I honestly, even without a Christian worldview, I don't even understand another possible alternative. So now we think, okay, we gotta take this more seriously. I also wanna remind you, especially since we're all living in the Western context, even though many of you are probably from other places, uh, for the majority of the history of the world and for the majority of non-Western world, the existence of evil spirits is taken as an obvious life reality. So let me just take you out of your context for a second. I think for the entire human race, and especially for those in a non-Western context, the existence of evil spirits is taken as an obvious reality. It is not debated. It isn't questioned. It's understood. So for us to come in and then say, well, you know, we know better now. You know, we've been through that. C.S. Lewis called it chronological snobbery, that, that the, the pride in being like, well, I'm smart now and they were dumb then. That's stupid. You know, that's not a good argument. It's just not a good rationale. It's not a good way of thinking. And also to think about this, what if our materialism and technological advances, especially in the Western world, are actually hiding from us the real realities of the universe? What if instead of enlightening us, which they are certainly in some ways, what if they're actually working to cover the real realities of the universe that people in other parts of the world who have less, what if they understand more? 
What if it's those with less that understand more? What if it's not us with more who understands more? What if we should learn? It's very prideful for you to look at other places and people and and assume that because of your technological advance and the place where you live, you understand the world better than they do. There's nothing but pride. Even if you're not a Christian, you'd have to call it pride. How could you think that way? So if the majority of the world believes in evil spirits, and if the entirety of the human race, people have dealt with evil spirits as an obvious reality, why in the world would all of a sudden now we think it's so silly where we live? Okay, so that's my moment for you to take this seriously, okay? And to really deal with the reality at play that there is a devil, there are evil spirits working around you to create these kind of evils going on. So the three enemies of your soul, the devil, the world, and the flesh. So the devil basically working through the world and the flesh. The world is external, the flesh is internal, and the devil working through both of those things. Now, this is your main problem. So here's what the, the, the verse says. Following the course of this world. That word following could also be translated something like under the control of. So here's what I want you to see. First, the Bible's definition of the word world in this context would be something like this. The organization of society in opposition to God. So when the Bible uses the word world, it, sometimes it does mean the physical world, but oftentimes it means this. It means the organization of society in opposition to God. It is the, the culture of the world. It is the, the, the personality of the world. It's the systems of the world that lead people away from the ways of God. So as it's talking about here, we're following the course of this world. You're following the systems and structures and worldview and ways of thinking that are opposed to God. And we're walking in that ourselves. So here's what I want you to understand first and foremost. Therefore, living according to the common currents of the world, when you live under the control of the world, you are not living in freedom, but rather in slavery. So here's the message of the world. Be free if you do it my way. The world is selling you freedom, but it's giving you slavery. You're not free by doing whatever you want. That's what the world wants you to do. Nobody calls doing what someone else told you to do freedom. How foolish it is, how tricky the devil has been to convince you that you are free when you are just being yourself. That you are free when you do what feels good. That you are free when you live according to the desires of your heart. No, 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 no. You are not free. You are a slave to the world. The Bible presents this as under the control of the world. The world sells you freedom, but it gives you slavery. You have not found freedom by doing whatever you want. You have not. And we're going to walk through that some more, but I want you to understand this concept from the beginning. And I want you to understand what real freedom is. So the world is operating around you in a way that opposes God. Now, as a Christian, those of you listening as Christians, this is a real discipleship thing for you to understand that the world that you live in 24-7 is actively working against your well-being and trying to kill the very things that will give you life. And if you're not ready to understand these things, like the one I just told you, like the world promises freedom but gives slavery, if I don't understand that from the beginning, I'm going to begin to follow the world around thinking I'm free but living like a slave. And I'm going to be stuck in ways and habits of life because I'm just living according to how I want when I thought that would give me what I want, but it doesn't. And if I just knew the tactics of the world, and if I just knew that I'm swimming against this huge current, I gotta know how the current works, then I could make some spiritual progress. And so those of you, you need to understand this is what you're fighting against so often in the world around you uh, that exist in opposition to God. Now this world that exists in opposition to God, says here, is ruled over by the prince of the power of the air, which is the devil. We know that because Jesus calls him this in several places, John 12, 31, John 14, verse 30, John 16, 11, and other places you could Google it. I'm not going to give you all the references, but this phrase, the prince of the power of the air, is the phrase that is used often to describe the devil because the Bible would teach us and show us that in some way the devil rules over the world as it is. But let me distinguish this. He doesn't rule over the world as the sovereign leader of the world. That's God who rules over all things. He rules over, think about him like the ringleader of the gang. The devil is the ringleader of the entire world that sits in opposition to God. And so now you have the devil actively at work through the world, the huge world around you, to take out little old you. This is your enemy. 
This is what is happening actively around you. And just to give you a real quick thing here, the book of Job kind of gives you an idea of the devil and his limits. The devil and God are not equals. They are not fighting a battle uh, that is unsure of who's going to win. Uh, the God is sovereign. He leads and rules over all things. We already know the end of the story. The devil is defeated. So they're not two equals battling. The devil lives and rules under the uh, uh, big authority of God. Uh, and he cannot do anything uh, apart from that. And so now you understand, okay, same. The book of Job gives you an idea of that if you just want to go look at that. So now you have the devil actively at work. And then it says here, through the sons of disobedience, verse 2. So now it is those of us who many, all of, many of us were before, and some of you still are now, actively working against God, opposing God, rebelling against God. The Bible would call that a son of disobedience, which means the devil is working through the world and through you to bring about his purposes on the earth. Once again, can I blatantly point out, there is no freedom here. The second Timothy two teaches us that we, apart from Christ, the Bible calls it, we are held captive by the devil to do his will. So you got to get this because now the devil's so smooth with it, you know, so smooth with it. Cause now he's working and he's creating mantras and ways of thinking in the world. And he's working along with, the Bible says here, your desires to bring about your destruction. So here's the third thing that holds us captive is the flesh. So you have the devil, the world, and the flesh. And here's what you need to understand. The devil works with our desires to bring about our destruction. This is why he's so smooth with it. And this is why it feels so right. Because the devil's not coming in trying to tell you to do the opposite of how you feel. Actually, the devil is inflaming the very things that you think you want in the first place, which is why it's so tricky. Because now you have the devil actively at work in the world around you, the creating mantras and ways of thinking and systems and structures that oppose God in the world around you. And then he brings you in this situation and he works along with your desires to bring about your destruction. So it's very tricky, right? He's smooth with it to say, well, if this feels good, then do it. The whole world is cool with it. Everybody thinks you should live this way. How dare anyone tell you to live a different way? If it's who you really are, no one can deny that, right? He's just going along with this. The whole world is in agreement with this. And then your desires match it to say, well, this is what I want. And then the world says, you should have what you want. And the devil says, you should definitely have what you want. And you, you work your life that way until all of a sudden, without fair warning, unless you come and listen to the Bible or hear what God has to say about something, when you thought you were free, all of a sudden, you land in a place of destruction. And the devil has slowly brought you there using your desires agreeing with your ways of life. Yeah, well, you want to live with that person? Go for it. How dare anyone tell you not to do that? Oh, you want to pursue that? Yeah. How dare anyone? Oh, you want to express this part of you? That, oh, how dare. And you just keep doing that, and you keep doing that, and you keep doing that, and you think it feels good, and you think, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've finally gotten out of the bondage and the slavery that God or the church might have put on my life. And the devil says, yeah, you're free. And let me explain to you, <clears throat> the type of freedom you experience in rebellion against God is the type of freedom someone would have if they jumped out of an airplane without a parachute. When as soon as you jump out of an airplane, you would feel super free. You put your arms out, you know, you'd be screaming, I'm free, I'm king of the world, you know, I'm like I'm Titanic, you know, I'm free. And you're free until what? Until you hit the ground. Then you're not free anymore. You're dead. What felt like freedom ended in death. This is exactly how it works. We say, I'm finally free. I can do what I want, live how I want. God's rules are so stupid. I feel so free. Yeah, yeah. I'm free to express who I am and live according to my identity and do how I want and live how I want. I'm so free. And you're free, you're free, you're free until boom, your, your life falls apart in ruins. Or even worse, you're free until you die. You meet the Lord and you stand under his judgment. You're free until you hit the ground. I just want some of you in this room who are maybe living apart from God's ways to understand that you may feel free now, but the ground is coming fast. 
You're free until you hit the ground. The devil has tricked you into thinking that your choices to live how you want are giving you freedom when all the while you are a slave to his rule and dominion. You are not free by doing what you want. So here's what I want to discuss this for a second, this idea of freedom. I want you to write this down because you need to think about it. Living out the desires and passions of my body and mine creates wrath, not rest. And it brings slavery, not freedom. So look in verse 3. It says, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, which flesh isn't just your skin, but it's your, your, your earthliness and your disposition against God and your impulses of your body to do things that are not right or even good for you. So you're living, you're carrying out the passions of your flesh uh, and the desires of your body and mind. I mean, does this not explain anything to you? The entire world is being restructured around the desires of people's bodies and minds. Is that not accurate? The entire world being restructured, not around objective truth, but around the desires of bodies and minds. Where do you think that would come from? This is the devil's strategy at work to affirm and to continue to help all of us live according to the passions of our desires and according to the passions of our flesh and the desires of our bodies and minds. I mean, this is the absolute opposite of what you are taught in the world every day, that you should trust yourself, that you should trust your feelings, that you should live according to who you feel like you are. Uh, The Bible would say the exact opposite. And for some of you, you really need to choose and stop trying to play both lines. Say, I'm either going to go with what God says or I'm going to go with what I feel. But just to put this frank to you, if you are living according to the passions of your flesh, your whole entire life is based off your feelings which are very fickle. And that, for me personally, would be a horrible place to put the foundation of my life. That doesn't seem very strong to me. If I'm just going to say, like, I don't want you to build an entire life based off your feelings. I don't think you would either. There's something better than that that we have here in the Scripture. So living out the desires and passions of my body does not create rest. It creates wrath. Right here it says you were by nature children of wrath. Here's another one for you to write down. Giving in to every desire is not freedom. It's slavery to the body. Here, real freedom includes self-control. You know this too, because if I ate everything I wanted to eat ever without ever considering what it is doing to my body, you would not call that freedom. You'd call it foolish. And if I exercise self-control to have discipline in that area of my life, you would say that I'm free. And this is true in a million things in your life. Real freedom is not giving in to every desire that I have, which you know this, because if in your anger you hurt someone, you would go to jail and you would be held captive. There are certain things you know you ought not to express. And I want you to apply that way of thinking to your entire life to say real freedom actually includes self-control. Real freedom is the ability to not do that which is harmful to myself. Do you understand this? Real freedom. I mean, you got to have good definitions here because the world is telling you to be free. And what the world means is freedom is free when you're free to do whatever it is you want to do. That's the world's definition of freedom. The Bible's definition of freedom is that you would be free to do what is best for you, which would require self-control and not doing that which is harmful to you, which would require an understanding of what is actually harmful to you, which is sin. Real freedom includes self-control. This is so important, so important for us. Real freedom is not giving in to every desire. That's slavery, slavery to your own body. Real freedom is self-control. I mean, you know this once again. I just want as, as hard as I can to help shove this into your experience. This is why the book Atomic Habits is so big, and it's a big deal. What is that about? Atomic Habits is not about freedom. It's about applying self-control to get to a place of freedom. The idea is that I would apply discipline in my life to deny myself certain things and to precisely do things I don't want to do but that are good for me so that I can get to a place that is good for me. 
You know this. I mean, this is how the world works. I don't do things that are bad for me, and I practice things that are good for me. I utilize self-control and discernment to get to a place of real freedom. And the more discipline and self-control I have, the more free I become. I don't become less free by exercising more discipline. I become more free when I have control over my body, that I don't do things that harm myself or others. You know this. So for you to think you are free by exercising every passion in your flesh and every desire of your body and your mind is absolutely foolish. And you already know it's not true because you don't think that about anything else in life. Real freedom is the ability to not do the things that are harmful to myself and others. Real freedom includes self-control. This is why in the Proverbs, I mean, I talk about self-control so much with my kids. I mean, this is so important. The Proverbs teaches us that a man without self-control is like a city without walls, which means that they are defenseless to attack, which means that the reason why you get so offended is because you lack self-control. And if you had more self-control, you would be more free from what people think about you. A man without self-control is like a city without walls. A city without walls in that time was not a free city. The walls are down. We're free. That's not what they would think. It'd be like a country without an army is a free country. Like, uh, no, that would be the opposite. A country without an army is going to be enslaved to another country. A city without walls is not a free city. It's a city that's open to attack. And a person without self-control and the ability to say no is not a free person. But it's a person that's more open to slavery and attack than others. Real freedom is the ability to say no to things that are harmful to myself and to others. It is not the ability to carry out every passion and desire in my flesh. And once again, you already know this intuitively, whether you are in Christ or not. And the Bible is simply coming alongside and explaining this thing to you in categories that now help you understand the spiritual nature of what's going on so that you can find the solution. Because the solution is not habit stacking or building atomic habits, which is helpful. I'm not, the book is helpful. The solution, though, as we're going to see, is something far greater in measure. And you'll never get the solution if you don't identify properly the problem. So the ultimate problem now, the Bible tells us, verse 3, is that all of this leads us to being by nature children of wrath. So even though we are made in the image of God and we all have value and dignity and worth simply in our creator, our creation, because we're made by our creator, the nature according to which we now live has been marred by sin. Therefore, our natural self is opposed to God and has joined the world in its rebellion against God which is mutiny, and therefore it puts us under the wrath and punishment of God who is king. So we are now, apart from Christ, we are in our sin, God's enemies. And God's enemies get God's wrath here by nature, children of wrath. Romans 5, 9 says, since therefore we have been justified by blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So I know this isn't the most popular subject in the world, but you and I need to be saved from God's wrath. Your greatest problem is not the health of your body or your mean boss or your wayward child. Your greatest problem is that your sins have placed you under the wrath of God. And this wrath is coming. It is the ground. You feel free now, but the wrath is coming. And this is why we need the solution we're going to talk about in a second. But once again, I want to address those of you who think, man, all this wrath, hell talk bothers you. And maybe some of you grew up in a place where that's all they talked about. And everybody's a sinner, everybody's going to hell all the time. Uh, And we want to obviously preach the truth that that is true, that sin leads us to hell. But we we want to overemphasize the goodness and love of God to save us in the gospel. But maybe some of you have been jaded, you know, by this idea of God being angry or the, the reality of hell, maybe some of those things. I know many, especially young people I talk to, that's kind of pushed them away a little bit from the, through the faith. And here's just what I want to put this in front of you, just to consider, okay? Wrath is not opposed to love, but because of it, 
God cannot be love if he is not also wrath. And once again, I just want to put it out there. You know this intuitively. Because love protects. That's what love does. Love is just. I don't think you would call it loving if a judge let a murderer go free just because. I don't think you would watch something like that, somebody who is serial killing people, and the judge says, you know what? I'm just feeling loving today. You're good, bro. I don't think you'd look at that and say, wow, what an act of love. No, you'd say, no, 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 no. You'd freak out. You'd say, no, 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 no. That's injustice. You'd say, I was just feeling loving. You'd say, that's not love. You'd say, what about the families? What about the loved ones? What about them? Do you love them? You'd be mad. Why? Because love requires justice. You cannot be a person of love in God's mind. You cannot. God cannot love if he does not also punish. What would his love mean? This is exact. You wouldn't call God loving if the crimes that have been done against you were never dealt with. You wouldn't call that love. Do you see what I'm saying? You know this. Wrath and punishment is a necessary element of love. If someone was trying to harm my kids, you would not call it love for me to stand by and let that happen. As a matter of fact, whatever I did to protect them, you would put in the category of love. Why? Because it's to protect my kids. Love protects. Love defends against wickedness. Love punishes evil. Love brings about justice. Love is not indifferent to pain and suffering. You see what I'm saying? You, some of you want some teddy bear, give you a hug version of God that makes you feel good all the time about yourselves. And so you've left the faith or you've left religion or you're teeter tottering now because you think God's too angry and because you can't stand the idea of hell. And I just want to put to you in front right now that you cannot have God's love if you will not accept the reality of God's wrath. And you wouldn't want to because a God who does not punish evil is a God who cannot love. And you would not feel loved if no justice was met for your life. It's always different when it happens to you. For God to be a God of love requires in its very essence that he be a God of wrath. And if there is no punishment for evil, then there is no love for good. A person who loves understands the difference and can discern between wrong and right. So wrath is not opposed to love, but because of it. And you cannot have God's love if you don't first understand God's wrath. See, these things work together. You simply can't split them up. And God's wrath is awful. I mean, the Bible describes God's wrath as what leads us into a place called hell, which is called a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, eternal pain and torment, separated from the love of God forever, every good thing any good thing you enjoy on the earth now, even apart from Christ, is an act of just living under the love of God. It's called common grace. And imagine then if you were put in a place where every good and pure and wonderful and beautiful thing was taken away forever. That's what it looks like. Why? Because you have chosen to rebel against God. You told God you didn't want him. And he said, okay. And now that places you under the wrath of God. So this is the greatest problem of the human race. And this is the free fall that we're all in. And until you understand the problem, you can't get the solution. So that's the bad news, all right? Lots of that. But now I got even better good news, okay? So here's the solution. If that's the problem with my life, the problem with the world around me, if these three things are the enemies of my soul, then how in the world am I going to fight against my own desires, the devil and the world around me? How am I going to find a solution for these things that you have talked about? How in the world does someone escape the wrath of God? Well, here's the good news of the gospel. It says right here in verse 4, that, or verse 3, your nature, the children of wrath, just like mankind. Verse 4, but God, who's rich in mercy, because of his great love, even we are dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Here's the good news and the solution is that God's love is greater than your sin. 
God's love is greater than the wrath that is coming against you. God's love is the solution for every problem that you have in life. It is the solution for your life, and it is the solution to save you from the consequences of your sin. God loves you very much, and he sent his only son, Jesus, to die on a cross to pay the wrath that you and I rightfully deserve and to raise from the dead so that you could put your faith and trust in him and have eternal life. This is God's solution to you because of his great love. I want you to think about it like Liam Neeson in Taken or something, you know. Uh, God has come to take you back from the captivity that you were found in under the spell of the evil one. God, this is deliverance. I mean, this is why the gospels play out like they do. Jesus is walking around, taking people back. He's saying, man, you're enslaved to demonic oppression, taking you back, man. You're enslaved to sickness, I'm taking you back. All the things that the world has done to beat down, to destroy, to break, Jesus begins walking around saying, no, 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 no. The devil doesn't have place and rule here. When Jesus shows up, he's king and he has all authority and he shows up to give mercy. And so the gospels play this out. Jesus is walking around, delivering people, delivering people, delivering people, just like Liam Neeson, man. He's got a special set of skills and he's walking around bringing people back from the captivity that they are in. And that is exactly what God has done for many of you and exactly what God wants to do for some of you today. He wants to deliver you from the captivity that you are under, under the spell of the evil one. So here's where the power to change comes in to turn your life around. So salvation, therefore, is more than forgiveness of sin, but it's freedom from slavery. It's therefore the power to change. You say, I've been swinging and not making much difference. And the reality is, it's because you haven't considered this, that God wants you and has saved you, not only to forgive your sin, but to grant you freedom from the three enemies that have waged war against your soul, which at one point, the devil, the world, and the flesh were in control of you, but now Christ has broken their bondage. Colossians 2.15 says that the, the enemies of the world, the principalities of darkness, they are disarmed, which means they do not have the same power they had on you before, which means now you are the victor and the conqueror, and now you have the power and the say-so in the moment, and instead of being under the oppression of the evil one, you are over in victory because of Jesus. What once controlled you and led you can now only bother you or annoy you. The three great enemies of your soul have been defeated by Jesus Christ. And therefore it is in this reality that you begin to make progress in life. I want to walk through a few parts of the solution here. First in verse five, it says, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. I love this phrase, even when, even when, even when we were dead, even when we were rebellious against God, even when we said we wanted to do things our own way, even when we were doing things that we regret now, even when the worst parts of our life were happening, even when the most shameful things we've ever done we were doing, even when and even then, even when we're so far from God and we said, I don't want you, I don't need you, I'm gonna do things my own way. Even then, at the worst possible moments of our life, look at this, God made us alive in Christ. Here's the reality. No matter what kind of sins you brought into this chair this morning, God has mercy for you. Even when, even at the height of your sinfulness, God has made us alive in Christ Jesus. This is the reality that God wants to bring to your life this morning, the hope that he gives you, even if you find yourself under conviction or the weight of the Holy Spirit, or you know you're not living the way that you should, God looks at you, not with anger, but mercy. And he says, even now, even in this place, even if what you've done, I want to make you come alive in Christ. This is God's offer to you this morning. Let me show you how God responds to our sin. So right, the problem is our sin has killed us, we're dead, And God doesn't look at us and say, well, I guess you're screwed now. Look, look what God does. 
How does God respond to my sin? Well, he's rich in mercy, he's rich in grace, and he's rich in kindness. That's verses four and seven. How does God respond to my sin? With great love, verse four. How does God respond to my sin? By making me come alive in Christ Jesus, verse five. How does God respond to my sin? By saving me by his grace, verses five and nine. How does God respond to my sin? By raising me up and giving me a place of honor in the heavenly places, verse six. How does God respond to my sin? By preparing good works for me to walk in so I can live with purpose. How does God respond to my sin? With love, mercy, grace, patience, and kindness. And wherever you're at this morning, that is exactly what God wants to give you. Watching online, sitting on your couch, sitting here, this is exactly what God has for you this morning. Rich in mercy, rich in grace, rich in kindness. I love this phrase, rich in mercy. You know what that means in the Greek? There's a lot of it. That's what it means. It means there's just a lot. To be rich means I got a lot. If I'm rich in money, I got a lot of money. And it says God is rich in mercy, which means he's got a lot of mercy, which means God has more mercy than you have sins to bring to him. You cannot out the resources of God's mercy. So I want you to fall on the mercy of God this morning, maybe some of you for the first time and maybe some of you again, to come to him and to receive the mercy that he wants to give you in Christ Jesus. God has more mercy than you have sins to bring him. Titus 3 verse 5 says, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we do, but because of his mercy. Some common man definitions of mercy and grace for you to live with, I think, are simple. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, and grace is getting what you don't deserve. So mercy is your debt is forgiven. Grace is here's an extra million dollars. Mercy is you don't have to go to jail. Grace is here's the best job now that you're not in jail. You know, like mercy doesn't punish. It doesn't give you what you deserve. It gives you mercy. And then grace gives you things that you don't deserve, like eternal life. This is how God wants to work with you this morning, give you mercy and grace. Another thing I want you to focus on as we we prepare to close This reality says that he has made us alive together with Christ. So if you are dead, the only solution is to come back to life. Not to like get better or to grow or, you know, some of you are trying to find different things to add to your life, but you got to come back to life first. You know what? You need a resurrection, not a redirection. You need a resurrection. You keep looking for a redirection, a new job, a new spouse, a new life, a new whatever, and you don't need a redirection because you can't redirect dead people. You need a resurrection so you can come back to life. This is what God has given us. If you recognize the problem is that I'm dead, then you stop looking for redirection and you start looking for resurrection, which is exactly what you get in Jesus Christ and is exactly what he wants to give you today. And some of you who have already been resurrected are still daily looking for redirection when you ought to be living in the resurrection power God has given you. This is the reality for us. Look, it says here, by grace, you have been saved. Let me read that again. By grace, you will be saved. It doesn't say that. By grace, you might be saved. No. By grace, God will consider your salvation. By grace, if you do enough good things afterwards, then you can possibly be saved. No. What does it say? By grace, say it with me, you have been saved. Listen to me, those of you who are in Christ. In Christ, you have been forgiven. Like sitting on that seat right where you are, no matter what you did this weekend. In Christ, you have been forgiven. You have been restored. You have been made new. You have been delivered. You have been accepted. You have been loved. You are not just a will be, but you are a has been. Everything you need, God has already provided for you have been, have been, have been. If you realize that you have been accepted by God, then you would stop looking for acceptance from others. If you realize you have been fully loved by God, you would stop looking for love in all the wrong places. If you realize you have been forgiven by God, you would stop living under shame, guilt, and condemnation. If you realize that you have been restored and made new, you would stop living according to old habits and you would find power to live according to the new man. Everything about you already has been declared over you, not because of something great you did, but because of what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. 
have been, have been, have been, sitting right there, you have to get this, you have been, have been living the forgiveness Jesus has already bought for you. You're not going to get him to forgive you more by doing better things next week. He doesn't forgive you because of you. He forgives you because of what Jesus has done for you. He doesn't love you because your behavior is so good. He loves you because of what Jesus has done for you. He doesn't accept you because you're acceptable. He accepts you because of what Jesus has done for you. So if it's about what Jesus has done for you right here, it is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no man may boast. So God has given you a gift. Stop living every day like you have to work for it. Have been. You can't be any more forgiven than you are right now. Have been. You cannot be any more loved than you are right now. Have been. You cannot be any more forgiven, accepted, restored, new than you have been right now. And the power for your life to move forward from this moment is that you would realize what has been already done for you in Christ Jesus and stop living for something that will be done later. In Christ, you have been made new and restored. And this is what the Lord wants for you and for me to live in accordance with. So I'm gonna have the band to go ahead and come up. And I want you to consider this now. The, the final thing for us here is that all this passage, once again, like chapter one, is all about location. The phrase with him or in Christ Jesus is listed six times in six verses, which means all of the benefits of being, of, of what I'm talking about, the new life, the solution to your problems, all of those benefits only come in relationship to Jesus. And so if that's not you this morning, you are currently on the outside of the benefits of the gospel. And I want you to enter into the inside of the benefits of the gospel. It's like when I tag along with people who have frequent fire miles, you know, and I'm traveling with them, it's great because I can, they, they, they travel a lot. So they have all the special cards that get into all the special rooms in the, ho, in the, in the, in the hotel. You know, there's like secret floors with secret things. Uh, you go in the airport lobby and there's secret rooms only certain people can get into, okay? Uh, I have no ability to get into those rooms by myself. I don't have enough flyers and I haven't, I haven't made enough money. But when I'm with someone who has, their access becomes my access. And this is exactly what want, Jesus wants to give you this morning, his access to eternal life, his access to peace, his access to restoration, his access to forgiveness, he wants to extend to you, but you have to be with him to get in that room. And if that's not you this morning and you're not with him yet, I invite you to join with Jesus. And the final invitation is they're based on the reality that verse one talks about ways in which we walked, before in sin, and then verse 10 talks about the good works that God has prepared for us to walk in. So the idea being that when I understand these truths appropriately, I no longer walk according to the wrong way, but now I begin to walk according to the good works God has prepared for me. And I live according to the purpose he's laid out for me. And what I want for many of you is to walk out of this building, walking in that new path by meeting with God in his mercy and grace this morning. And so as we sing, I'm going to invite you, if that's you, just to come down front, to kneel down here. We don't really have an altar because, you know, we did the stage thing. But, you know, just come down here and just mark this moment with the Lord to say, I want to be new in Jesus or I want to renewal with Jesus. I want to walk in the way that he's called me to walk. Uh, I'd love to pray for you. Uh, if you need that, we'd love to do that. But just want you to respond to God now. So go ahead and stand up. I'm going to pray. And we're going to leave a little space now to respond to God. And once again, if that's you, I invite you to come up, get prayer, kneel at the altar, or pray uh, with the Lord. Heavenly Father, we love you. And I pray now you would work in our hearts and our minds. Thank you for your mercy and grace towards us in Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.